This segment is concerned with the continuity of functions and we'll deal with the continuity of correspondences later in the course. Now there are lots of different notions of continuity, but they all basically express the idea that two points that are close together in the domain of a function should have images in the codomain that are also close together in some well-defined sense. So we'll start off with some definitions, first continuity and uniform continuity, and then we'll define Lipschitz continuity, which is important in the theory of differential equations, and we'll show that the contraction property, which we've been looking at in the past couple of segments, is a special case of Lipschitz continuity. And we'll end this segment by looking at a couple of different definitions of continuity and show that they're in fact all equivalent to each other. And this includes a definition based on the inverse images of open sets and a definition based on the convergence of sequences. We'll start with this definition of continuity. Suppose that X and Y are two metric spaces. Strictly speaking, X and Y are non-empty sets and associated with each set is a distance function but I'll leave the distance functions implicit for the moment and make them explicit only when needed. Now a function f that maps x to y is said to be continuous at a point x in the domain if for every epsilon positive there exists a delta positive such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x. And if f is not continuous at x we say that it's discontinuous at x. And for any set s in the domain if f is continuous at every point in this set then f is said to be continuous on the set, and if it's continuous on the entire domain, we say that it's a continuous function. Now here's a somewhat stronger definition of continuity. If x and y are two metric spaces, a function f from x to y is said to be uniformly continuous if for every epsilon positive there exists a delta positive such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x for all x in x. In other words, for any epsilon positive, there must exist a delta that works for every point in the domain. And as an example of a function that's continuous but not uniformly continuous, just consider 1 over x with domain and codomain both being the strictly positive real numbers. For any given epsilon, as x gets closer and closer to zero, we need smaller and smaller deltas, and there's no delta that works for all x in the domain. Next, consider Lipschitz continuity. So here we have to make the distance functions explicit. So let x dx and y dy be two metric spaces we say that a function from x to y is Lipschitz continuous if there exists a real number lambda such that the distance between the images of x and y is less than or equal to lambda times the distances between the points x and y. And this is true for all pairs of points x, y in the domain. Now if this inequality holds for any given lambda, it obviously holds for any larger lambda. And we refer to the smallest lambda for which this inequality is satisfied as the Lipschitz constant of f. Now this definition should look very familiar to you. If lambda happens to be strictly between 0 and 1, then this definition corresponds exactly to the definition of a contraction. And so a Lipschitz continuous function with Lipschitz constant between 0 and 1 is a contraction. And if lambda is less than or equal to 1, we say that the function is non-expansive. And you should verify that all pseudo-contractions are in fact non-expansive. Now let's consider an alternative way of looking at continuity based on the inverse images of open sets. Now given our definition of continuity, we want to show that a function f is continuous if and only if the inverse image of every open set in the codomain is open in the domain. Now if this is true, then a function is continuous if and only if the inverse image of every closed set in the codomain is closed in the domain. And this follows immediately from the fact that a set is open if and only if its complement is closed. Okay, so let's prove this theorem. And we'll start by showing that if f is continuous, then every open set in the codomain must have an open inverse image in the domain. So suppose that f is continuous and v is an open set in the codomain. We want to show that every point in the inverse image of v is an interior point from which we can deduce that the inverse image of v is open. Now if v has an empty inverse image, the result follows immediately. So consider any v for which the inverse image is non-empty. Then there must exist some point x in the inverse image and so the image of x must be in v. Now since v is open, there exists some positive epsilon such that the epsilon neighborhood of f of x is a subset of v. And now we just apply our definition of continuity. Given this epsilon positive, there must exist some positive delta such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of f of x, which itself is a subset of v. Now this in turn implies that the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the inverse image of v, and so x is an interior point of this inverse image. And since x was an arbitrary point, the inverse image of v must be open. Now consider the converse statement. Suppose that the inverse image of v is open for every open set v in the codomain. We want to show that this implies that f is a continuous function. 
Now consider any x in the domain and any epsilon positive. And let's define v as the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x. Now since all neighborhoods are open, v is open. And by hypothesis, every open set in the codomain has an open inverse image. So the inverse image of v is open. Now this implies that there exists some delta positive such that the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the inverse image of v. This is because x is an element of the inverse image of v and the inverse image of v is an open set so x must be an interior point of this set. Now since the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the inverse image of v the image of the delta neighborhood of x must be a subset of v. And so we've shown that for any x in the domain and any epsilon positive there exists a delta positive such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x. And this of course is our definition of continuity so we have proved that the function f is continuous. And this completes the proof of the claim that a function is continuous if and only if the inverse image of every open set in the codomain is open in the domain. We'll finish this segment by looking at yet another definition of continuity. We say that a function f is continuous if and only if for any sequence of points in the domain that converges to a point x in the domain the sequence of images f of xn converges to the image of x. So let's consider any sequence of points xn in the domain such that xn converges to x in the domain. And we want to show that if f is continuous then the sequence of images f of xn converges to the image of x. Now consider any epsilon positive and the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x. By our definition of continuity there must exist a delta positive such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of the image of x. Now we know that since the sequence xn converges to x there must exist some number m such that once you get past this point in the sequence all subsequent terms lie within a delta neighborhood of x. Now this means that the images f of xn must lie in an epsilon neighborhood of f of x once you're deep enough into the xn sequence. Just verify that this follows from our definition of continuity which is shown on the slide. So we've proved that for any epsilon positive there exists some number m such that if you get past this point in the xn sequence then every point in the sequence of images f of xn must lie in the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. And this is true for any epsilon positive so therefore the sequence of images f of xn must converge to f of x. Now to finish up we'll consider the converse claim. We want to show that if the sequence of images f of xn converges to f of x then f must be a continuous function. So consider any x in the domain and any epsilon positive and we'll do this by contradiction. So suppose that f is not continuous at x. In that case there exists no delta positive such that the image of the delta neighborhood of x is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. If there were some such delta then f would be a continuous function and we're assuming that it's not continuous to generate a contradiction. Now this means that for every delta positive the image of the delta neighborhood of x must contain at least one point that lies outside of the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. Now define the real sequence delta n as 1, 1 half, 1 third and so on. Then we can construct a sequence of points in the codomain yn which has the property that each yn is in the image of the delta n neighborhood of x but is not in the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. Just convince yourself that this can be done based on what we have shown to this point. Now the inverse image of each such yn is clearly non-empty and so we can construct a sequence in the domain xn such that yn is the image of xn and furthermore xn lies in the delta n neighborhood of x. Now since these delta n neighborhoods are shrinking to zero you should verify that this sequence xn converges to x. Now we are adopting the hypothesis that for every sequence xn converging to x the sequence of images f of xn converges to f of x. And this means that there exists some number m such that if you go past this point in the sequence of images f of xn must be an element of the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. Otherwise the sequence f of xn couldn't converge to f of x. But f of xn is just yn and we constructed our sequence yn to ensure that no point yn was in the epsilon neighborhood of f of x. And this is the contradiction we were looking for and it leads us to conclude that our supposition that f is not continuous at x is false and so therefore f is indeed continuous at x. And that proves the result we were after. Now you'll see later in the course that this sequential approach to continuity turns out to be quite useful when we consider results like the theorem of the maximum. But we leave that for another day and stop right here.